Okay, the 1950s is our fourth section um, for Unit 9. Uh, the 50s are not just the 50s. You're going to see that I, I say that it's basically what we deem as the baby boomer generation, 45 through um, 63. For our state standards, we a lot of these are what was the impact of World War II. You're going to see there are a lot of broad ideas that you, that you have here, and then there's specific vocabulary to go with it that you have. So again, our bracketing dates, 45, 63. In the middle, Sputnik, which we'll cover more in the Cold War, and Little Knot Rag 9, which we'll focus on civil rights in another section um, there. So, the 1950s um, there, 45 to 63, choosing kind of the, the assassination of JFK. That kind of takes away some of the innocence of our American culture. The baby boom. Why was there an increase of children born after this time period? There's multiple reasons. It's not one. The soldiers came back from war. Yes, that's the broad answer, but as they come back, many of them got married. Uh, many of them were making up for lost time. Uh, we also have the case of the economy was better and you combine that with the economy wasn't good in the Great Depression or people didn't have as many children during the war. So this is where when you hear of baby boomers uh, there, that's why we have it. Later on we're going to see where this baby boomers, where they are now in retirement age and how it affects you when we go to the different demographic trends. So the case of Social Security and we're always joke to you about don't worry about it, about, about the national debt or the social security problem that's coming up in the 2030s or the Medicare problems in there. The workers of NARA will pay for it, but that's where for the boomers we'll have. All right, the GI Bill, which officially is called the Service and Readjustment Act of 1944. Um, there are two laws that you have to know in this section that are maybe two of the greatest laws ever passed for the United States. Now, this bill was one that helped make sure we didn't make the same mistake that we made after World War I, which are soldiers returned from World War I and they were told, great job, and there was nothing there for them. And they had a hard time adjusting with what they called shell shock at that time, PTSD today. Um, but, but we didn't have it. A lot of them were homeless. A lot of them were not able to adjust. So what ends up happening, there's two parts of this that, that you need to know. The first part was, the idea for higher education. If you served in the military during World War II, you had a chance then to, to have education. It could be a tech school, it could be a junior college, which, which were now becoming something bigger. It could be for a university. Now, where I say, how does it change the face of college students? Before World War II, we didn't have scholarship programs um, unless you had someone that was fortunate to basically sponsor you like a scholarship. But, if you weren't rich, you didn't have much chance to going on to, to a college. This will change it because it didn't matter whether you were the richest or poorer person. If you were a veteran, it gave you an opportunity to. Now for Florida University system, we will, and I'll have another slide tell a little bit more about it, but at that time, starting from 1905 till, till, till the after World War II, we will have three state universities. We will have the segregated University of Florida A&M in Tallahassee. We will have the Florida State College for Women in Tallahassee. And then we will have the University of Florida for Men in Gainesville. Well, after so many men came back, we will end up making it co-educational for Florida State and University of Florida. Doesn't make much of a difference for Florida because it wasn't that there was a large number of women going, but for Florida State then we will have it where we will have men and women that, that are, are going. Now the second part of the GA, GI Bill that was very important was it also gave low interest loans to, to the veterans. They could use it for a home, they could use it for a business, they could use it on their farm. And what we're going to find is this is going to have an effect on so many other aspects where we're going to have the suburbs, we're going to have it where, where businesses that are started and the franchises that come about um, there. And again, this is one, one time where if we were to say what were some of the greatest bills in the history of the United States, this is definitely probably in the top 10 and an incredible impact that you have. Again, for Florida, you will see that in 47 that this is where we will change. The junior college system is also added um, there where we didn't have it at that time um, there. A um, little side story about Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds was the top football player in the Palm Beach area. In the days of the early 50s, mid 50s when he was there, usually if you were the top football player in that area, you went to either University of Alabama or University of Florida. 
Um, but this new co-ed um, Florida State, Burt Reynolds decided to, to go there because as he walked around campus, he noticed there were a lot more gil girls for every guy. And at University of Florida, there weren't very many women. And pretty much he said, well, I like girls a lot more than I like dudes. So he came. Fortunately for him, his football career didn't last very long as he had a major knee injury and he will then join the drama department at FSU and from there he will go on to Hollywood and will become in the 1970s the biggest box office draw um, that, that you have. But that's why he ended up at Florida State and not Alabama or Florida like most of them. All right, this is something that I don't spend a long time on here. AP-wise, we go a lot more in detail of it. But Truman, you do have to know that his plan was called the Fair Deal. Um, he proposed a lot of things like the national health care um, system in 1948 um, that was never passed. Um, what is Obamacare was actually then first introduced over 50 years before with this. And a lot of this was just an expansion upon the New Deal policies of FDR. But between having a Republican-controlled Congress and the Cold War taking priority, hardly any of these things will pass on there. But it will set the tone because uh, d a decade later, we will have John F. Kennedy that pushes these through with his new frontier. Still, most of them won't pass. Um, and it won't be till Lyndon Johnson uh, that a lot of these things will pass. The 22nd Amendment was passed in 1951. Straightforward, it, it limits the president to two terms, where George Washington had had an unofficial rule that every president had upheld until FDR. FDR will go to win a second and third term. We will make it now an official rule um, we have. What is one little part of your notes, but extremely important, we'll be coming back to this in the Civil Rights Movement, but you don't have to know the number 9981, but the executive order. One of the things that Truman tried to push for in his fair deal was a lot of civil rights, and Congress wouldn't pass it. They would not even pass an anti-litching law on there. So Truman said, well, I will do what I can take, what I can actually um, do. And since he was the commander-in-chief of the military, he will make this executive order, and we will desegregate the military. So World War II was the last time that we had a segregated milita military. Now, with an executive order, the next president or future president can reverse it, but no president would do that. So here's our first action by government truly going against segregation. The Supreme Court will get involved when in 1954 we have Brown versus Board of Education, and Congress will not truly get involved until 1964 with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But this is where you need to know that the president that desegregated the military is Harry Truman. Not very popular at that time, but something, something that was seen afterwards as, as something that was the right thing to do. Um, Harry Truman, when he left office, did not have a high approval rate or, rating, but when we look back on it, things like this, as well as where in the Korean War decisions that he makes that we'll have in our next section, is why people say, no, he didn't do what was popular, he did what was right, and now that's why he's considered one of our greatest presidents. All right, the 1950s are best known for the Eisenhower decade. Eisenhower was a, won both the 52 and 56 elections. You notice on the two electoral maps, there's a lot of red. The only blue is in the Deep South, which was still more of your, your Southern Democrats at that time. Adelaide Stevenson and many other, any other decade probably would have had a great chance to win. But Eisenhower was not only a military general, was just seen as a great leader and just an all around good guy. Um, the checker speech, um, this is where in the 52 election, because Eisenhower wasn't seen as a diehard Republican, in fact, they didn't even know until a little before, before um, um, the 51-52 the began for the presidential election, that whether he was Republican or Democrat, they put a young communist fighting true Republican um, in, of Richard Nixon on. Well, Richard Nixon had been accused of a lot of different things um, there and some things with money that maybe was illegal. And he goes on the TV and he's one that uses TV um, great at that time as he will then go and tell us in his speech and then he will go and talk about the only thing he's ever gotten illegally is this dog. And it wasn't illegal and he's not giving it back and everyone's like, oh, look at the dog. And that's where you see the picture of checkers with the kids. Uh, there and it's a great political move because all the other allegations just kind of vanish away. For Eisenhower, he is a lot of times seen as one of our greatest presidents economically. 
um, here. And he was a physical conservative, but what what we have to kind of look at, and this is where I know I emphasize it again and again in class, is, is sometimes it just matters when you're president. All right, was Eisenhower actually a great economic president, or was he lucky enough to be during a great economic period? It's kind of like the same thing with Bill Clinton. Was Bill Clinton a great economic president, or did he happen to be president during eight, eight years at the 1990s that the economy was doing really good. We normally give way too much credit and way too much blame um, when it comes to presidents for the economy. Um, some of you may remember the MAGA girls um, in, for a recent election, but this is where we have the Ike girls. So I like Ike in their dress, Ike for Eisenhower. All right, um, for the businesses. We will have a very short recession right after the war ends. Um, this usually happens because the, they have to retool. But um, that, when that recession hit, people were scared we're going back to the Great Depression. The Employment Act of 1946 um, said that we were going to give everybody a job, which is kind of like communism. Um, it doesn't pass, but it does show that people were really scared. Where earlier we learned about the difference between white collar and blue collar and pink collar jobs, we will find a huge growth in white collar jobs during the 1950s. And one of the contributors to this is the expansion of higher education with the GI Bill and more universities that are expanding. Now what about Rosie the Riveter or Rosie the, the electrician or Rosie the, the welder? What happened to her? Well, Rosie was told, go back to the home. Or if they are working, it was more of your pink collar jobs of being secretary or, or, at, or a telephone operator and they were not getting paid as much during this time. I know I've, I will refer, I've referred back to this or referred to this when we were during the World War II, but because of the ration system and people saving so much, and then when people were buying war bonds, that money was saved up, and then the war bonds were gonna come mature during the 50s. People will have a lot of extra money, and one of the many factors that helped to make the economy so big what you have to realize is the 1950s was a situation that will never occur again. And baby boomers that grew up in this were very lucky that they grew up in what, what is probably not, not just for the United States, but for the world, the luckiest generation for what they were born into. The, we were the powerhouse of the world. I mean, Europe and, and um, Asia had been bombed. It will not be until the mid 50s that their economy is finally starting to get going so we are well ahead of them we're producing half the world's oil we have all we have over half the world's gold um there so all of these things kind of came together we um there and what and the machine that we had made during world war ii was then harnessed for for this economy um so this is where, like, we were so far ahead. Um, we showed American story of us. The average American family made 15 times the amount of, of money as the average European family. So we were number one and by a long run. Um, we're right now we're number one and we're kind of looking over our shoulder as, as China seems to be catching up with us. As a couple of years ago, they passed Germany for number two. At that time, there was nobody even in sight um, that we have. All right, two business terms you need to know are franchises and conglomerates. A franchise, most of you know for McDonald's, this is where it's the same thing wherever you're going. So whether you are in Inverness, Florida, or you're in Walla Walla, Washington, you know what you're getting when you order a Big Mac. Um, meanwhile, it may not be as good as your little roadside restaurant, but that's where you know what you're getting on there. Conglomerates also grew during the 19. Um, 50s, these were these giant businesses, the corporations, you see a lot of symbols as you see now. Now for franchises and then somewhat for kilometers, one of the things that this will be is it'll kind of go to this whole idea of conformity and um, um, the one culture that we're having in, in the 1950s. So um, and take away some of the uniquenesses of, of that. Here for Florida, one of the businesses that that's, that um, grows in the 1950s and our homegrown business of public supermarkets that we have. All right, for the labor unions, um, another one that for AP gives a lot more in detail, but you just need to be familiar with the Hart, that's Haft Hartley Act. The main thing that you need to know on it is the fact that it will be, make it where states can be right to work states. That means they outlawed the closed shops that we studied about in the 1920s. Um, the major impact of that's going to be over multiple decades because there will be a, a shift in, in a lot of the factories that will try to get away from places that did not have or were right 
that had the power of the unions. So when we think of Motown and Motor City and Detroit, well, oh, um, once those factories started getting older, because it didn't happen immediately in like 48, but a, a decade, two decades, three decades later, when the factory got too old, it wasn't worth rebuilt retooling on the inside they started moving so now ford has factories in atlanta georgia jackson mississippi texas san antonio texas so they, they moved to that area to these Sun Belt states on um, there and that's going to be one of the many factors that contributes to this it's definitely not the only factor since world war ii there's been a huge factor of moving from the old area the rust belt think rusty of old to the sun belt which is the south and the west um, that is continuing today, um, some states more so than others. Like right now, California is not really growing, but we have a huge growth in like North Carolina, Georgia, and, and Virginia. Um, part of that will be the shift of industries. Part of it will be the effects of the New Deal projects are there. A big thing will be air conditioning. I mean, can you imagine living in Florida, Arizona, Southern California without air conditioning um, there? And again, it's continuing right now. Um, Florida is a great example of this um, there, which we'll all, all concentrate on Florida here. Now here, this map is showing for the 50s, and you notice for the blue has the biggest growth in the 50s um, there. You notice how much for Florida that we have. You see California, you see Arizona um, there as massive grow, growing areas that you have. This kind of shows it over time period. I love this map. Um, I'm not going to say much on it, so you might want to pause if you're there. But this is where it shows of when the plurality of houses were built. So you see all that in yellow? That's 1930s and before. So most of the houses built in those areas up north were built before 1930. Meanwhile, for our county, we're 1990s. Um, and that we have it. You see some counties in Florida are after 2005 even, but you see the south and the west, the Sun Belt, is where the greatest growth would be for, for recent time. And you wonder why, look at that picture of Miami in 1947. If you're someone living up north in the middle of January and you got a foot of snow on the ground and you haven't seen green grass um, in months, and you remember back when you did your basic training um, in Florida and you were outside of Stark and then you got you did other training in, on Palm Beach or Miami um, there, where do you want to do? And this is where again you see the 40s growth for US 15%, Florida 46%, so three times the rate of the, what the national growth was within the state of Florida and it'll go even more in the, in the 50s. Again, air conditioning is a great reason why. Um, you see for Florida, where we were 27th in 1940, we were 20th in 1950, we are now the third largest and, there, and just continuing to, to, to grow with this. A few changes there for, our, for Fort Lauderdale. Miami from 67, just look at the skyline uh, there where you see they're building what will be, it looks like a part of the interstate with this giant interchange, but look at the skyline and how many skyscrapers were, were built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Meanwhile, a trend that we have is we have dead counties and about a third of the counties in the United States are dying counties, which means their population's actually going down. Um, people are moving away. We're going to see in a second death by interstates, which is similar um, there for towns. But, but in North Florida, if you are in North Florida, if you aren't on the beach or a suburb of Jacksonville or Pensacola, a lot of those haven't grown and Chipley will be a, as a great example of some places that hasn't changed a whole lot. All right, I mentioned the GI Bill was one of the greatest bills passed in American history. Another one is the Federal Highway Acts um, here. And I don't have a lot of in-depth notes on it. There's a lot of these houses that compa ca connected. Um, the part that I show for American Story of is great. I will know I spent a lot more time discussing this in class. Um, some of the stuff that has nothing to do with the EOC or the history, but how the numbering is, where you see the numbering system for the interstates, um, even numbers go north to south and they start lower to higher. So you see I-10 goes from Jacksonville to San Diego. Meanwhile, you see I-90 is up high. Meanwhile, the odd numbers are roads that go north to south and they start for five in California, 95 on the east coast. Um, there and I talk about with the Florida system too. Now, why was it made? Eisenhower had saw how effective the autobahn was in Germany, and it was made for military. Um, there, um, certain things like I point out in, in class that one of the one of the provisions on it, if it's geographically possible, they have to have straightaways in, um, every five or ten miles, so that if there is, <coughs> excuse me, a need for um, Airport runways because of, of war, they have that. 
So even though it's made for military, it will help greatly in expanding the suburbs and the um, consumerism that we have today. <clears throat> now, death by interstates, this is where for all over, and a lot of you know this because you saw that great historical movie, Cars, um, there, where, um, was it Radiator Springs or something like that, um, where it was on Highway 66, but when the interstate came, people stopped going through those, those old highways. Now, for Inverness, we didn't have death by interstate, and I always joke around that we're not a dying county, we didn't have death by interstate because people come here to die, and that actually is truly what has saved Citrus County is the fact we have so many retirees coming here and that's the basis of our economy, whether it be construction or um, service sector jobs or health care that we have. The Florida's Turnpike was, was also connected with this where we, we have it. Um, it changes the lifestyle thing and this is where automobile, we became a, that we were even more so of a car culture and you can even see where places that ha have, have developed after World War II. Florida, California are based upon the automobile. Um, the, the interstates will help expand the suburbs we're going to talk about in a second because it, it connects it. The railroads, what was the number one system? We will become a nation because of cheap gas at that time that why send it to a railroad depot when we can have a semi bring it right to the back door um, there. So the railroad system will go down. The idea of a homogeneous U.S. because as people are traveling from place to place um, there, we will this will make it where it's more of the same, and that's what we're going to see TV does that. Some other effects that, that we have, um, vacations because of traveling on there, motels, where it used to be hotels, we'll do the motels, which a motel has the doors on the outside. Then when crime rates went up in the 60s and the 70s, we will get back to the trend of hotels. And then cars and consumerism that, that we have in there, and having to have the newest car and everything that, with, that goes with it. Youth culture will continue to grow at that time. I showed that commercial, it's a great commercial kind of showing the, the um, stereotypes even within that commercial that we think of of suburbia and the middle class family and cars. Now, after World War II, and you're going to see some of these graphs, in it, the suburbs are going to grow immensely. I show the video about Lovett Towns in here, the mass producing of the house. There's a lot of factors of this. The GI Bill, people that now can, veterans that can get low interest loans. People for the baby boom, a lot of people don't want to live in the city when they can live in the suburb and have a backyard for the kids to play in. Because of the depression, we didn't build many houses in the depression or World War II, we have a huge need for more houses. People have more money from saving in World War II and the bonds. The Interstate Highway Act will connect the suburbs with the cities where people can work. Now this is not a term that's made up, but white flight, which we will see the impacts of this in the 1960s and 70s. But what happens is the white families are moving to the suburbs and the mi white middle class, they're moving to the suburbs and we're taking with them the property tax. And so the inner cities are getting hollowed out. A lot of minorities, immigrants are the ones that are left there. And what happens is again, not immediate, but after a couple of decades, the schools that depend on property tax, the fire departments, the police departments, they all start eroding because they don't have as much money because the money has moved out to the suburbs. You see this graph? Um, in here, you notice how suburbs grow immensely in here. Urban, rural changing over time. So these are all the ones that you can have um, in here. Broad idea that we have here, and again, the business boom that we have, the economic possibility. Again, America was by far, we were so rich on um, there. A term that you actually do know, but you may not realize it, is planned obsolescence. And America was a throwaway society. You would buy a refrigerator and planning on buying another one within two or three years. Where now, I mean, if you're getting a new refrigerator after like 12 to 15 years, you're thinking that's that it didn't last that long. Um, I know we sometimes talk about how great things were built at that time, but the cars didn't make it to 75, 80,000 miles very often before the engine blew. Today, if you had a car that the engine blew one or 200,000 miles, you would be disappointed. So. Yes, the base part of it was pretty solid, but that doesn't mean that it was always better for things. Now, you might say, but yeah, but people buying a new car every two years or new refrigerators, we never do that. Yeah, you do with your cell phone and technology. Um, how many times has Apple sold a, a new iPhone and all they did was one little change? The only difference was is they would have, GE would make a new refrigerator, they would change the look of the front of it and put a new light in the, um, on the inside of it, a little different place in the refrigerator, and voila, people want to have the newest refrigerator, just like people with an iPhone. 
or if you did have your refrigerator break after two or three years at a time, is it really worth the money to get it fixed when you can buy some buy a new one for a little bit more money um, that you have? Kind of like if your cell phone breaks and it's three years old, it's probably better to buy a new one. Have a ton of new products, time-saving products. Again, it's another American Story of Us videos that we show, and advertising is going to be really big. Um, you might want to stop this if you're looking on this online, but this is where the yeah these are some some commercials that I show that probably wouldn't go today. Uh, doctors supporting cigarette smoking, husband spanking his wife over getting the wrong coffee, encouraging you to have your children earlier. All right, for television, there's going to be where a lot of these shows um, here, and when you hear about Ozzy and Harriet World or Leave It to Beaver World, those are fictional shows from the 1950s. But the idea of so many of these are. Dad goes to work in the city, mom stays home in the suburbs taking care of the house and takes care of the kids. So you see this in show after show. We have, even in the cartoons, the Flintstones and the Jetsons are actually the same way. A culture is portrayed as this middle class, upper middle class white culture. All these people are, are white um, that, that you have. And it's going to contribute to, to make. We're going to lose a lot of our dialects and over each generation our accents are less and less. Um, there. Can you imagine how strong a Long Island accent was a hundred years ago and a southern accent, which now those are a lot less. And that's kind of, the, again, with that homogeneous culture that we have. Does with words, too, um, here. And this is where words that for different people I have, and a lot of that's dying um, there, where I'm from the South. So when I say, do you want a Coke? I don't actually mean Coca-Cola. Some of you would have said a pop or a soda um, there that you have. Rock and roll will emerge in the 50s. It's a blend of gospel, black R&B, white country music. The biggest star of all is going to be Elvis um, in here. Um, this is something that, that I spend more time on in class, but the Pale of Scandal was where we have DJs, disc jockeys that were getting paid off, and they would play the music. And what happens is, at that time, if you heard something and maybe it was something that, that you don't like it the first time but it grows on you, then you're more likely to go and buy the records. And the type of records were the LPs, which are the big albums, or the 45s, which are the smaller ones. It's kind of the same as you today, where you might purchase online and download an entire album, or you may just do an individual song, which is like how a 45 was. I think Ellis was pretty big in the 50s. Okay, One year he has all top 15. Here it is when he's at uh, St. Petersburg. And yes, he was in Citrus County. Um, he made a lot of movies. I'm not sure if I can ever say there's a good Elvis movie, but this is definitely not one of his better ones. Um, there would follow that dream. But where a lot of it was filmed in near, nearby Yankee Town, um, right by the bridge is still there near the end of the road at Highway 40, which they call Follow That Dream Parkway. But we had a scene, scene, court scene that was filmed in the Citrus County Courthouse. There's also one what is now a title office, but a, a bank scene um, that, that was filmed there right in downtown Inverness. And they stayed at the Port Paradise in Crystal River, which used to be one of the biggest um, resorts on the west coast of Florida. Now all of this all these different inventions and things gave people a lot more leisure time and they had more money and what ends up happening is we have a lot of extracurricular activities that have um, sports that are growing and again TV we already know of. we already know of more vacations now some of you might look at this and say what do you mean by football's passive but bowling's active well passive is mean more watching on a Sunday afternoon not a whole lot of people are actually playing football though a lot are watching meanwhile not a lot of people watch bowling, but a lot more people going. This is also a time period that hunting and fishing becomes a lot more of a sport. Very few people today have to hunt or fish to put food on the plate. Um, in fact, it would be a lot cheaper for me if I was to sell my boat and not spend so much money fishing, and I could go to Publix and buy some really nice fish all the time. Um, dime stores, or what you know as five and dimes, you see that one picture of Walton's 510. It's a five and dime. That's that's where we will have, a, where you think of like a Dollar General, where a lot of cheaper things that you have, but a general type store in that way. Um, Walton's Five and Dime will eventually become Walmart. Um, here's where for a picture, and you see the kids looking at the TV, and this is where some of the criticism that people will say that TV, and my generation, it was that people were with a PC, your generation with, with the cell phone um, there. No, the TV didn't ruin that generation. Um, they are just like a PC phone. Now, doesn't mean that too much of it is is not um, is good. 
All right, two doctors you need to know. Dr. Spock will write a book on raising children that edition after edition have been used. Some of you that had time out when you were younger, well, your parents probably used the ideas of Dr. Spock that started back in the 50s. Now, Jonas Salk, you're probably looking at and say, I don't know him in here. Um, must not have been that important. I've never heard of that. And there, well, can you imagine if you made a vaccine that got rid of, of cancer? I mean, pretty much got rid of cancer there. Do you think you'd be famous in history? Well, 50 years from now, when people don't know what, what cancer is, except for something in the history book, would you be as famous? And this is where polio, um, I saw one thing that polio killed, killed um, percentage-wise um, what today would be cancer and heart disease together. And, and Dr. Salk was able to reduce and pretty much almost eradicate it um, there. Organized religion expands a lot in the 1950s. Now, I always put it with quotes um, in here where we were the most religious in the 50s of any time in the history of the United States. Because there's a big difference between faith and religion that, that you have. But this is where some of the conformity, also the effects of the baby boom um, that we have, that people are wanting to take their children to church. But the 50s will have the highest percentage of Americans that, ever, that are attending church regularly or in, and are members of churches. For women, again, I were seen back in the traditional role. We'll come back to this in the feminist movement. Um, and if they do work, they're paid less than men. Um, one of the things that we have, we have some of the feminist movement starting, and I like to point out here that I Love Lucy show was a little different than all those others because Lucy was more independent. Um, and that's where it kind of showing some, some of this idea that, that we have. All right, the last part is about more of that conformity. And we will have pretty much a repeat of the lost generation writers of the 1920s with the beatniks or the beat movement. And they're going to write and they're going to be writing about materialism and conformity in modern society. I, um, for a lot of you, if you read the book Catcher with, with, in the Rye, you would think they're talking about today, um, about st youth that are needing to conform. But even if you're conforming, you still don't feel like you're a part of it and that alienation that, that you have. Um, here. So again, it's something that goes beyond that, that time period. Um, for a sociologist, David Reisman, he was writing about how Americans, we were no, no longer individualistic, we are a very conformist culture, and we'll go up and down with that. A book we're going to refer to later on um, that was written in the 50s was called The Other America, and it will have a great impact because Michael Harrington writes and says, you know all this stuff with the, the um, suburbs? It's really good for people in the suburbs, but the other half of the Americas kind of got left behind. What if you're from the inner city? What happens to those inner cities? We are no white flight. What if you're from a little town in Florida, not a suburb? So how was Inverness, Florida uh, there? Do you think they, they were a great place like some of those suburbs? Or were they struggling? And this is where rural areas and how they're struggling. So again, it was, it was like a lot like the muckrakers that we had in the past.